um, with Sufism, there's a lot of you know pe people taking advantage. There's a whole murid and and sheikh and yeah. sheikh and kind of say whatever he wants, and he becomes a like a master with all these people, and he tells them to do this and do that, and they just have to do it because the uh, like he, it's a test, right? Like I remember Bilal Phillips, I was Salafi myself, and he was talking about how some of these Sufis. He was saying that like it, you know there's this blind obedience that they teach you that okay I'm gonna teach you not to have ego. Mm -hmm. And then, right. well, how do you teach me not to have ego? Well, you, I'm going to make you clean up after me, give me food, you know, do all. And sometimes it's even sexual exploitation too, right? Of course. Right, right. It doesn't stop at. Well, they say like, give my firstborn child. They give my, um, what I heard was with my, what my grandfathers used to do was they literally used to take people's firstborn child. People would feel compelled to give them their first, like to be a house slave in their house, right. you know? Like, oh, wow. And I'm like, what? So, so the resentment is real because people are just like, you know, I was trying to, you know, learn from your grandfather and he took my first born child. When you trust someone, whether it's, um, you know, like, a, like, you know, like not just, not just the imams, but like when you have any sort of person that you trust, especially like a religious leader, whether it's a pastor or the imam or the Sufi mm -hmm. sheikh, and you're leaving your kids with him, it, it becomes hard for you to see when there's abuse. Because you, you know what I mean? Like it's it's some human flaw that we have that we. Well, it we becomes have. personality worship, right? It becomes yeah. very quickly. It becomes a personality worship, and I think a lot of these chefs and uh, you can see videos right now because we're living in the twenty first century. They, even all of the crevices of of of, of uh, the darkness of humanity are filmed today, right? So we can see people. Louis, there's a chef, right? In in, in, in in I'm not sure where he is in Somalia, but he's in Somalia. His whole thing is that he reads Quran on a barrel of water and he sprays a whole bunch of people with the water. Okay. Oh my god. Yeah, you know, yeah. Most oh. the people yeah. there are women, right? The most yeah. of the people there are women in niqabs and full, right? And he's spraying them with water. Oh my god. Suit competition. With water. Yeah. And pay, people actually pay money. And, and and these are people that are already not you know, the most financially yeah. set people. So he's taking money from needy mothers instead of that going to their kids. He's taking that money and he's spraying them with water. So they go in completely dry and come out wet and they paid some money. That's the I, whole thing. That's And so the, the level of ridiculous needs to be kind of called out at some level, right? If not but for what, what, uh, what? religiosity, then th this money can easily go to these kids that you have that you need to feed, right? It's just a more and practical approach. At the very least, that's that's part of it. I mean, worse than that is just like they think that this is actually going to solve some some problems. Like, let's say they have you know some sort of mental issue. Um, you know, like it could be schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a very real issue. Some people suffer from it. They hear things. There's nothing there. And sometimes they even know there's nothing there, but they're still hearing it. Um, there's one, there's one Ted talk of a woman that says she sees a clown in the corner of the vision everywhere she goes. And these tend to be scary images. They're not like smiling clowns. They're like scary clowns or whatever. Yeah. You know, sometimes the voices are telling you like you're an idiot, you're a fool. I know one guy who has an, has um mm. mental health issues in his family. His mom was his mom was, you know, institutionalized and he has issues too and it got triggered from some stress in his life. And he was saying people were he was hearing you're stupid, you like it was some it was bad things he was hearing. So can you imagine you're in a culture where you're told jinns are real and you're yeah, hearing exactly. what yeah. are you gonna exactly. think? You're gonna think I have a exactly. mental disorder? And you know the funny thing and is, you, you take antipsychotic drugs, and these these gins go away, <laughs> right? Yeah. And that here, therein lies you re the crux of a huge problem that's happening in the diaspora and in Somalia. So now we have a race, I think, of somewhere where it's somewhere ridiculous, like something at least over seventy to eighty percent PTSD rate, because obviously we've had a civil war. And subsequent um, bombings, we have a culture of bombings. People are literally dying every week to the point of there's an apathy when it comes to violence. Do you get what I'm saying? Because people, and I, I feel as though the Somali community has got such uh, trauma levels. Like, I honestly, I've, I've received a lot of abuse and threats and violence since being, um, obviously, coming out on Twitter. Shout out to all those people. I'm not mad at you at all. I'm just saying. Because I, I, I'm not mad at them because I feel that we come from a community that's really traumatized violence is normal to us 
um, as you said, you know, a lot of these people do have schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is huge in my family. Like I've got several family members, um, unfortunately, that are really unwell. Um, and absolutely. And, and the challenge of getting them on medication is, you know, we get them on antipsychotic medication. Then what happens is obviously the voices stop, um, the delusions stop. And so they, they attribute that to du'a and prayer, you know. Um, so it's like a so you know, cycle. You have people in your family that had this yeah, exact yeah, yeah, issue yeah. and they took anti-psychotic exactly. drugs and it solved the gin problem? Exactly. Wow. Exactly. This is the story of my life, like literally. But, I know that many people um, that, yeah, it's, it's really common. But, but they also, so if they, they also did the du'a, as long as the, they don't stop the drugs, like they can do du'a. Yeah, the problem is, is they don't have insight. The problem is with most of the um, most of the uh, mental health um, issue, like schizophrenia. You know, when you talk about personality disorders, you know, when they're in manic state of bipolar and stuff, these people they don't have insight into the thing. So insight is like knowing that you ha that you're unwell, knowing that you're sick. Yeah. That barrier and that barrier, by the way, um, so insight can be blocked by you know, like so. So things like stigma can stop obviously people getting help because they obviously stigmatize themselves. They don't want to be labeled um like there's just so many things that go into it and then religion for me is the worst um aspect of it so for me the reason what i've seen is religion it just has become the thing that has stopped people from getting help in my community and i'm talking like put it this way it's so common um like i go to the psych ward on, honestly i'm there like every month like put it this way all the mental health people in melbourne know me because um, I'm obviously visiting, always visiting family members, and I've got several family members I'm I'm a carer for. Um, whenever I go there, I have this heartbreaking moment. I look around and I see other Somali women with jilbabs. I'm talking about women, six, seven children, uh, because they've been abandoned by men who married other women back home in Somali. We've got this, like, we've got huge problems. Um, Islam is is like, you know, Jesus. for me, it's exacerbating the problem and yeah. and stopping us from talking about them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were going to say something, Khan? Yeah, it's, it, Islam, um, just to carry on what uh, Nuno was saying, Islam is often used as a justification because, you know, leaving someone, going somewhere else, marrying two, three other women, having their, you know, other families, that is, that can easily be justified and explained away. And mm -hmm. it doesn't Anything matter how you feel about it because if you bought in, then you have to submit. That's what Islam stands for, submission, right? So you've got to submit to whatever, however you disagree with it, it doesn't matter. It's not about you, it's about the word of God. And I think that's like the biggest kidnapping of the soul, <laughs> if you will. Like it, it really just kind of holds people in this position where they're like, I can't agree with that, but I have to agree with it. Like it's in this part. It creates it. I actually believe it creates mental illness like mm -hmm. exactly. me down this rabbit hole i actually believe that um islam is creating mental illness in my people so what's happening especially in the west we've already had a civil war these people are traumatized for other reasons they've had a civil war over tribal issues they come to the west right um you know the men themselves have obviously um because islam allows them to marry four women and the men themselves are traumatized themselves, have got issues, you know, they might have be struggling to get jobs themselves. They might feel emasculated in this Western society, you know. So then they take that frustration out on their women. So it's either they're either abusing the women physically, and that's justified in Islam, or they will just abandon that family altogether. Because a lot of the men, and it's like everybody's a victim in this situation because the men just feel pressure. They don't know where they fit in the society. They the kids are just like going left, right. So they're probably just thinking maybe it's this wife, you know what I mean? Let me just get a new wife. They've, they've got depression and anxiety and PTSD themselves. They're like, let me just go back home and maybe marry a new woman. It, it's halal for me, you know? So again, it's not the men's fault, you know? Islam allows it. Let me just go back to, you know, get another wife, see how it goes. They try to they try, they, yeah, they try to remedy mental illness through the Quran. <laughs> right. Not only through the Quran, but also through actions. Like, for example... They're like, let me go marry a younger, more pretty wife. Maybe that will cure my depression. Do you get what I'm saying? A lot of these men are depressed as well, too. So then that doesn't work. And then meanwhile, back at the ranch, you know, your first wife has, is having a nervous breakdown and the children there are abandoned. So they're, you know, um, now at Black Lives Matter process. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You see, it's a flow on effect. You know what I'm saying? The whole community is like... Um, yeah seriously in and, and the women and and the reason why it causes mental illness is because 
the woman is like this wearing this jilbab, this covering, you know, she's mm. trying to cover, she's trying to be the best pious woman and she's seeing her, her life falling apart. You know, her man's off married a, mm. a younger woman. Yeah. Um, she's, she might've been abused and that's justified. Um, her children are off in this Western world. She doesn't fit. She can't make friends with the Jennifer across the road. She can't understand her, you know? So she's like trapped. You start talking to yourself and in that starting to talk to yourself, that's where the mental health issues begin, you mm. know?